to the 10th in the current topic series. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Howard McLeod, who recently moved to the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. He's a medical di director at the De uh, DeBartolo Family Personalized Medi Medicine Institute, as well as a senior member of the Division of Population Sciences. Dr. McLeod's a leader in the field of pharmacogenomics, a relatively new discipline that explores how genetic information influences our response to drugs. His research has already had several effects on FDA policies. For example, he and others have shown that genetic variants play a role in patients' responses to warfarin, a blood thinner prescribed to more than 2 million people in the United States. Based on these analyses, the FDA issued new dosing guidelines based on the genotyping of two genes. As the new medical director of the Personalized Medical Institute, Medicine Institute, Dr. McLeod will be involved with the Moffitt's Total Cancer Care Study to create and share targeted cancer treatments that will improve patient outcomes. During this morning's lecture, Dr. McLeod will be expanding on both these stories as well as telling us, as well as telling us about other developments in pharmacogenomics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McLeod to the NIH campus this morning. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back and, and to uh, update you on, on what's happening. Uh, every, uh, seems to be things happen every, every two years in this course, and uh, it's always surprising how much has happened and how little has happened uh, in, in, in two years. And that's, that's true with all disciplines. There's things that we're still talking about today uh, that, were, that were discovered decades ago, and there are things that, that have moved on to the point where we don't even talk about it anymore, anymore because they've become routine. Um, and so that's uh, uh, certainly, certainly true in pharmacogenomics. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, uh, some of the emerging trends of, uh, in the field, some of the ways that we've been thinking about um, how to, to uh, advance the discipline, and then also um, some of the ways we're trying to make sure that uh, it's not just the, the rich countries, or the, in our case, the formerly rich countries, um, that, are, that are benefiting from the, the, genomic, uh, the, the genomic advances that, that are happening. Now, I like to start pretty much every uh, uh, presentation that I give, not with this, although I'll, I will present for that. Um, I, I, uh, I do, I'm on the board of directors of a, of a s small uh, company down in RTP that is a pharma services company, but is unrelated to uh, the, the topics that I'm speaking about today. Um, I like to start with, with this particular quote, uh, and that is, a surgeon who uses the wrong side of the scalpel cuts her own fingers and not the patient's. If the same applied to drugs, they would have been investigated very carefully a long time ago. This quote is supposedly from 1849. It's a journal that I don't read. Uh, but um, of the drugs that are approved by the US FDA in 2014, or since, since the, the beginning, beginning of time, until 2014, there are none of them that we really know the mechanism of action. We, we know something. We call them something. We call them a, a cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor or a hilfoy isomerase 1 inhibitor. But COX-2 inhibitors have activity in COX-2 knockout mites. There's something else going on. And so that's true with all of the medicines that are out there. We know something about them, but not a lot about them. And so there's a lot of advances still in terms of discovering what the genes are that, that, that regulate the effect of these drugs. How can we use that information to, to guide therapy? Or how can we use that information to even just counsel the patients better in terms of what to expect um, in, in cases where we don't have a lot of alternatives. And, and thankfully, in, in modern times, for most diseases, and I know this is the NIH campus, and so there are a lot of extremely rare diseases that are seen in this building. But for, for most diseases, certainly the common diseases, th there, there are many active treatments that are available uh, for, uh, for, for use in, in modern times. And so if you take an extreme example, for the treatment of high blood pressure, the US FDA has approved uh, more than 100 drugs or drug combinations for the treatment of high blood pressure. And so when you sit down with a patient and try to decide which medicine should we give th this particular person, how do you choose? Well, you choose the one you know how to spell um, is, the, is almost the way we do it. it, it there, there really isn't a lot of science that goes into it. It's more clinician familiarity uh, and sometimes cost sometimes uh, other elements, um, and often it's trial and error. We'll, we'll try a beta blocker, we'll try an ACE inhibitor, we'll try a whatever, um, and, and see if it works, and then try it again. And so even though there are a lot of medicines, there aren't necessarily a lot of objective ways of choosing which medicines to use for an individual patient. And that's, that's where some of the promise around not only pharmacogenomics, uh, but, but uh, pharmacoproteomics and pharmacowhateveromics 
um, in, in terms of trying to choose people a little bit more uh, useful way. Variation in the response is, is also the norm. You know, the uh, bacterial infections, there, there's a lot of success. Bone disease, a lot of success. But for most diseases, we, we get it right approximately 50% of the time. So whether it's mental health disorders or cancer or, or some, some other uh, uh, of your favorite illnesses, um, often the first therapy will work in around half of the people. And then the other half need a, a second therapy, either sequentially or simultaneously, or a third therapy or a fourth therapy. Gradually, there might be some benefit brought to the patient, uh, but, but often it'll take a few tries uh, to get there. And so this variation is not only a, a, a waste of resources and a waste of opportunity, because for many diseases, the first opportunity is the best opportunity, but it's also a, 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 it decreases the, the trust in the whole health system. Um, as things go on. When, if you can't get it right after the fourth time, can you blame someone for trying uh, an unproven uh, alternative approach? Uh, because certainly the, the proven approach is not working very well for them. And so there, you can see the, the need to really get it right the first time from an economic standpoint, from a patient care standpoint, and from a, a, um, a health system process uh, standpoint. Toxicities also remain relatively un, unpredicted. I mean, of course, you, you tell, uh, tell the patient the, the most common toxicities, but any of you that have watched TV have seen a TV ad where the, the last uh, seven seconds of the ad was someone talking extremely fast, saying a bunch of toxicities that could happen uh, to, to you or your loved one. Um, and, and certainly, toxicities can happen in a very vague sort of, uh, sort of way. But to an individual patient, we, we often cannot predict who's going to have trouble and who's not. And, Toxicity matters a, a lot when it, when it comes to, to um, the benefits of medicine. So I think most of you would agree that statins, the, the, um, the anti-cholesterol class of, of medications, have, have been shown to have amazing public health impact. Some have argued that it's, it has the most important health, public health impact of any medicines that have ever been uh, developed. But that public health impact only is true for those people who take the medicine. Those people who don't take it, even when prescribed, do not get that public health benefit. It's not just a, a benefit by association. It's benefit by actually taking the, the pill. Um, and, and so what we've found, and what others have found as well, is that by the end of the first year after being prescribed statins, only about one in three patients are taking the medicines as prescribed. And the reason why most have stopped, some have stopped because they don't really visualize themselves having the disease and just can't care. Um, some people stop because the, the drugs are too expensive, but the majority stop because of the muscle pains they're getting, not, not rhabdomyolysis, since their muscles aren't shredding, but rather just the inconvenient pain that, that occurs in day-to-day -day life. And they think, oh, I just can't be bothered. I'm going I'm to take a weekend off um, because I have the, the, fa the family reunion, or I'm going to take a week off for this cruise, or, or take a, what, just a little bit of time, and before you know it, they're, they're not taking it at all, or taking it very little. Um, and so toxicities matter not only because of the acute event, but also because the whole public health benefit of giving a medicine in the first place um, does not, uh, it does, is not realized uh, when toxicities are, are occurring. And so there's not only a, an individual patient care element of this, but really a, a, um, a health system and societal aspect to, to toxicities and getting it right the first time. Toxicities also are, are something that happen to the patient and not the prescriber. And certainly in the areas that I work, uh, toxicities can be extreme to the point where we don't even care about them. And of course we care about them, but we don't really acknowledge them. So with chemotherapy, one of the most common toxicities is chemotherapy-induced uh, diarrhea. Not a topic that we we'll necessarily talk about it at, in the morning, uh, but, but it is, it's true. Now, if, it, when I go to, to uh, a study center to look at the, the toxicities, toxicities are graded from zero, meaning it didn't happen at all, to five, meaning the patient actually died from the toxicity. And so when I go to the data center, I'll ask the statisticians, just, just give me uh, the grade three, grade four toxicities. Thankfully, there's not a lot of grade five. I don't, don't even bother with the small stuff. Well, I can tell you, if I had grade one diarrhea from chemotherapy right now, I'd be talking to you from somewhere out in the hallway uh, uh, hopefully by audio and not video. Um, it's, it's not a, a, uh, a trivial thing to the patient, even though as an investigator, I don't even care about it. It's not, it's not um, emotive enough to really uh, beg my attention. 
Um, and so toxicities are something that really have not had the, the full service that some of the disease aspects have in terms of genomics and in terms of other aspects of trying to figure out what's happening. You know, we sh we'll sequence tumors to try to figure out which drug to give, but we won't sequence necessarily the person's germline with the purpose of, of choosing which drug based on toxicity. And I can tell you in oncology and in most areas, therapeutic selection is a tiebreaker exercise. You have two equal therapies and you're trying to just break the tie. It's not awesome therapy versus sucky therapy and you have to have a really good reason not to give awesome. It's, it's two equals, often not so awesome. And you're trying to decide, well, which of these do I give the patient? Um, and it's just a feather will shift the scale. It's not something that needs necessarily amazing data. And toxicity is usually that feather uh, that, will, that will cause a shift to uh, one therapy versus another for, for many disease areas. Now, the other element that none of us want to talk about um, is the, uh, the, the cost of, of healthcare, the, the cost of medications. And, and it's really, it, it's something that as, as, um, as academics, we want to focus on you know, shrinking tumors and avoiding Stevens Johnson syndrome or some of the severe toxicity. We, we don't really think about the cost element, but yet it's, it's profound for the, for the patient and often causes them to make decisions that we just cannot understand. Why would you not want to get this therapy? Well, the fact is, even the well-insured have significant out-of-pocket expenses. You know, many of the, the therapies for cancer, the new biologics, the new uh, kinase inhibitors, uh, will, will be s somewhere around ten to twenty thousand dollars per month. With a ten percent, with a well-insured person, will have a ten percent copay, and it is capped at some point. But most people don't have a, an extra thousand or two sitting around there that they wondered what to do with. And, and often people will be faced with the decision, do I mortgage my house uh, do, uh, to, to make sure I can pay for my care? So the, the economics have to be part of the decision um, as we go forward. And, and we can't be analyzing just, you know, what's the PET scan look like for the tumor, but rather how do we put this all together? And we'll come back to that point uh, towards the end. Uh, because we, we, uh, we don't, I'm not intending that someone who's an amazing genomic scientist or an amazing clinician or amazing biochemist should suddenly become a health econom uh, economics person. Um, but rather, interacting with those folks to ask smart questions, with sometimes with financial endpoints, um, is, is an element that we need to be uh, focusing on a little bit more often than we are now. Now, this, uh, this slide is really hard to see from here, so you probably can't see it at all uh, from, from there. Um, it's from a uh, science translational medicine um, article that Jeff Ginsburg and, and uh, Jeanette McCarthy and myself put out uh, late last year. Um, and, and really, the reason for showing it is not to go over it in detail, but rather to detect there's a lot of different areas uh, that have to be taken into account as we try to optimize therapy uh, based on, on genomics. Um, there's, there's new diagnostics that are coming through. And so lung cancer is not lung cancer anymore. It, it's one of many different elements, subtypes of, of, uh, of, of cancer. Uh, the, the, um, the early diagnosis aspect is not only happening in terms of childhood uh, 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 maladies, like you heard about last week, uh, but, but also is happening in terms of, of predicting uh, which diseases one might have, or early prediction of one, whether one might have a recurrence or not of their disease, or subsequent resistance. Uh, is there a subclone, a resistant subclone, that maybe only a half a percent of the, of the total population currently that could emerge and be, be uh, uh, taking over um, over time. You know, those types of, of things are really coming forward. So it's no, it's no longer one SNP or one, one genotype um, equals a therapeutic decision, but rather a constellation of information that's helping inform um, how a patient is managed, not just w at this visit, but longitudinally over the, over the course of their care. Um, and so we, we have to be thinking about a lot of different aspects um, and we'll hit on some of those over the, the next uh, few minutes. Now, in terms of pharmacogenomics, there is a lot of different activity happening under that name. And, and, and really, the interaction between drugs and the genome um, does offer a lot of different opportunities. So there is still a lot of discovery to be, to be made. Um, with all the, the variants that have been discovered, you'd think there wouldn't be too many left. Um, and yes, there are rare variants, but there's also uh, variants that are unique to populations that, that have not been very well studied. So, you know, for example, uh, in some of the work that Moffitt's doing, uh, Moffitt Cancer Center is doing in, in uh, uh, Puerto Rico, have found that the lung cancers 
Um, there's some variants in lung cancer that affect uh, therapeutic decisions that occur in around 10% of the, the US-based uh, population, uh, both the, the, the white and, and African-American population, but occur somewhere around 30% of the, of the Puerto Rican population. And so uh, Puerto Ricans were not a population that had been well studied in the previous cancer studies. Now we're finding interesting facts. And that's just a, a small little anecdote. There, but there are many throughout the literature and throughout the, the current uh, scientific exploration where populations do have some unique features where discovery is still uh, relevant at the sequence level. Um, even for common things, they're common for that population, not necessarily common in all, in all people. There, there's still a lot of difference in, in uh, phenotypes. So whether this is the incidence of, of uh, uh, drowsiness after a certain medication or whether the, the incidence of a blood level or whatever it might be, still a lot of explanation going on in terms of, of, uh, of, of genetic exploration. There, there's still, of course, those rare individuals. We, we have people who we give one dose of oxaloplatin and their nerves just are, are broken up uh, based on uh, just on a single exposure to these drugs. There are other people who get a, a, a single dose or a short course of, of carbamazepine and get Stevens-Johnson syndrome. These very extreme events are, are still a very rich source of information um, and, and uh, have been the, the, the subject of not only a lot of high profile publications, but a lot of data that has resulted in, in changes in FDA package inserts and changes in routine care um, in, in many different countries. Clinical trial inclusion and exclusion, exclusion um, is now uh, very much full of uh, genetic information. It used to be there was a traditional phase one, phase two, phase three type of drug development, and we still uh, pretend that that's the case. But the reality is often companies are, are trying to stack the odds in their favor early on, not from a marketing standpoint, but from a drug development economic standpoint. So if you know that uh, the extensive metabolizers have a, a better theoretical chance of outcome or practical chance of outcome compared to the poor metabolizers, you might do a study just in this group, compare the results to, to a, a competitor medicine, um, and see whether this select group uh, 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 clears the bar in terms of having superior um, outcome. If it does, then you can go to a traditional phase one, phase two type of model, maybe using all patients, not even selecting. But you've done that initial experiment in people who are enriched for success, and if it doesn't work there, you kill that, that drug right now, where you've only wasted a uh, million dollars or a couple million dollars and not a hundred million dollars. And so we see that a lot now in early drug development for all different classes, going into a genetically defined population as a almost a phase zero or phase 0 0.5 uh, type of study, define whether there's some proof of principle, proof of concept, and then expand out into the, the formats that are required for FDA approval. And then we'll hit on some of the, the practice elements there, but a lot of different aspects um, happening now for, uh, for this topic. The other thing is that there is more than one genome that's relevant to the patient. I'm showing you here a, a, a picture that depicts uh, alterations in a tumor and alterations in the normal tissue, both of relevance to a cancer patient. But this could easily be an HIV patient or a hepatitis patient where the virus genome is as or more important to the treatment uh, than the, what's going on in the patient's normal genome. And certainly the hepatitis story has taught us a lot that it's both the viral genome and the patient's germline genome that, that has, a, it has clinical relevance in terms of some of the therapies that are, they're using. Um, and so we cannot be thinking this, uh, this simple um, religious-based approach that has been taken in the past where either you're a believer in the somatic genome or a believer in the germline, and you will defend your genome to the hilt. But rather, we need to be thinking about how do we improve care for this patient who happens to have both within them, um, and both need to be accounted for. And so this, this approach where we're taking into account uh, both genomes simultaneously is really uh, being a much more rewarding strategy, risk-benefit, not just benefit or risk um, in, in isolation. Um, and so that's an important element as, as we go forward. Now, the way pharmacogenetics or pharmacogenomics is being applied is really rather simple at this point in, in, uh, in routine practice. It's uh, often used retrospectively, clinically, to explain an untoward event. So someone received 5-thorouracil or capecitabine, a 5-thorouracil prodrug, had a very severe reaction, 
and you want to know, was it dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase deficiency that caused them to get that extreme event? Because if it was, you now know to either not use that drug or use extremely small doses. Whereas if it wasn't that event, you, you now need to use a, a different strategy in terms of, of uh, managing the patient. And so that's a, a common uh, example. There are also areas where there's low utility that are end up being requirements for insurance coverage. So if, if you are, have a colon cancer that has a mutation in the KRAS gene, you will not benefit from some of these expensive antibody therapies. Uh, and therefore, without evidence of genotype, insurance companies will not pay for the medicine. And so as you can imagine, um, a, as an economic requirement, that test is done very faithfully um, because there's not just clinical but also economic reasons uh, to make sure that happens. You have ac el uh, evidence for dose selection in terms of, of whether someone needs a normal standard dose or a, a higher dose. Uh, therapy selection in terms of whether one gets a, a, uh, the, the most commonly used medicine in the case of, of clopidogrel for, for stent placement in the heart. Clopidogrel or Plavix is a, is a commonly used medicine for there. But in patients who have mutations in sepsis C19, uh, they can't activate it as, a, as faithfully. Um, often people will use a, a different medicine um, that's more expensive but, is, doesn't, that, but bypasses this particular activation step. And then you have preemptive examples. So this particular genotype is used for the HIV drug Abacavir, but there are other HLA markers for severe hypersensitivity reactions. Some of them occur more commonly in East Asian populations. And you'll see in countries like Taiwan, Thailand, uh, and, and China that uh, these tests are routine in terms of the management of patients receiving carbamazepine, some of the HIV drugs, allopurinol. Uh, they're paid for by the government. They're a, a routine test because it's such a high frequency of event, whereas in the United States, it's not used as frequently, used more commonly on the West Coast than the East Coast, uh, but, but they, these tests have not, uh, have not become as popular um, in terms of clinical management. Now, in, in terms of pharmacogenomics in 2014, th there are quite a few examples where uh, application is happening. It's not something that may happen someday, although it will well increase in time, just like every other uh, as, knowledge, uh, as knowledge goes forward. A number of these examples are, are tumor um, aberrations, uh, some of them quite old. The HER2 the HER example is, is quite old, um, where a tumor abnormality in copy number, in sequence, uh, in rearrangement will lead to a, a selection of a medicine or a deselection of a medicine in, in, in these, uh, these cases. There are also examples that are associated with uh, toxicity that will require altered dosing, uh, examples associated with hypersensitivity reactions, Examples in terms of, of drug therapy uh, so selection, uh, many different types of examples uh, that are used. Now, what's shown on this slide are the examples that have made it into the dosing and administration section of the FDA uh, prescribing recommendations, or the package insert, as they're more commonly called. Now, the reason that's important is that there are 140 different drugs, or, or more than 140 now, um, that have genetic information somewhere in the FDA insert. But this list here, they're in the dosing administration section, which is the section that is uh, supposed to be read by prescribers. It's the section that is read by the, the iPhone apps that, uh, that you use to prescribe. Um, it is the section that's read by the insurance companies. And unfortunately, it's the section that's read by the litigators. Um, and so you see a lot of, of, uh, of litigation emerging where someone did not do a genotype, something bad happened, and then they can use that, that result to, uh, to beat up some poor sap who was doing the best they could. Um, in some cases, the, the, uh, the event happened before the FDA even acted. Um, but yet, uh, that doesn't stop the litigation attorneys um, in terms of, of, uh, of trying to take a, a genomic-driven approach um, for, for that. Uh, but there, there are examples now, and the list uh, increases uh, as, as the data um, uh, allows. Now, I'm going to hit on a couple of different points um, over the next little period of time. Um, one is around discovery, because there's still a lot of discovery to be done. If you look at the FDA-approved drugs, uh, sorry, if you look at the, the top 200 prescribed drugs, there's only a, a, about a fifth of them that have had serious genomic analysis of any type, at least in the public, published literature. Now, many of those are old drugs, and so there is no sugar daddy to pay for that study. Uh, the NIH has not been a, a big funder of, of pharmacogenomic studies. Uh, there, it's been more in, in industry or in, in foundations. Um, and so many of the old drugs are kind of old and boring and, and have not uh, necessarily received that, that type of, of uh, evaluation. 
And so there's a lot to be done still. And even some of the examples where work has been done, there, there's still uh, elements uh, to, to, be, uh, to, to be defined. Now, I should like to show this slide as a way of reminding ourselves that we know something, uh, but we don't know enough. Um, this is a, an anti-cancer drug. Uh, it, it goes into cells, and it's, it's pumped out through an active transport. It's inactivated through P450s in the liver. It's activated in the plasma through this metabolite which is pumped out, which is inactivated, which hits a cellular target, cell death occurs. I mean, look how smart we are. I mean, we're geniuses. And if I had a better graphic artist, I'd be even smarter. Except here's the real pathway, especially in the area of pharmacodynamics. Uh, it's, it's like, uh, I don't know if it's Yogi Berra or Donald Rumsfeld, but we, we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. I mean, we, we, we have a situation where someone has looked at these particular genes and has seen some sort of effect in cells, in mice, in man, somewhere. But it's not as if someone has really asked the question, which genes are most important and are regulating? Um, let the biology tell us where, where to go. And so uh, it's often the situation where I've got an assay for CYP3A5 running in my lab, so I don't care what the question is. The answer is CYP3A5. And, and we see a lot of that even in modern science, uh, where, where people, you know, I've invested in this assay, so I'm going to run this sucker. Um, and uh, and, and uh, we need to uh, be, be stepping uh, back from that uh, because often it's leading us down uh, uh, blind alleys. So a lot of discovery still going on in, in mouse, uh, in man, in family studies, in, in all sorts of different approaches to, to, try to, uh, to try to help. But really, a not a lot has, has been done. We're very early in this field. The term pharmacogenetics was coined uh, over 50 years ago. But the, the science, in terms of really trying to aggressively define which genes are important, is, is rather new. Um, as of yesterday, uh, there were 2,228 genome-wide association studies in the NHGRI uh, GWAS catalog. 73 of those studies had a drug-related phenotype of some sort, so less than only 3% or so. Um, very few of them had a large sample size. Uh, a minority of them uh, found no significant hits at all. Uh, there's a, just, uh, just around half had a replication cohort of some sort. Um, and that's an improvement because a few years ago when I looked, it was uh, a lot fewer that had replication cohorts. But even though we have this, this mess and this, you know, we've hardly ever even started to try, um, there have been 11 of these studies that have contributed uh, to package insert changes at the FDA. And so, there, there are some, some, uh, some bits of gold to be pulled out of the mine, but it, it takes effort to, to get that out. And, and really, we're just starting to try in terms of finding what are the genes that are important. In some cases, there will be no genes that are important, um, either because uh, the, the effect of any one gene is so small or because it's post-genetic effects that are, that are critical. Um, or there'll be some cases where it gets all the way to the point where we're, we're driving patient care uh, based on, on some of these changes. But we, we have to do those studies, so there's a lot of work uh, still to be done. We've also stepped back in some areas and, and tried to do things in a little bit different way. So if you can imagine where have the big successes happened in terms of gene finding. Um, mice have been a huge success for, for disease in general. Uh, family studies have also been a huge success, even in the next-gen uh, sequencing era. Uh, family studies have been a, a very valuable source of finding real genes that hold up as being clinically important. And, and so that's great, except family studies are tough to do with certain therapeutic classes of medicines. Like anti-cancer drugs in general are, are very hard to give to normal volunteers. Uh, the, the risks are just too great. And you're bringing volunteers into, a, into your, your lab or your clinic uh, to do a study, you know, sorry about grandma is not something you want to be saying to your volunteers um, because you gave them neutropenic fever and died of sepsis. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not like there's an inconvenient rash. It's something a little more than that uh, that often will happen in these cases. And so one of the things that, that we and others have done is, is uh, tried to uh, step back and say, well, what else can we do? And one of those is using immortalized B cells, EBV trans transformed B cells from large families. Now, some of these families are these, uh, these Ceph families, uh, the name shown, shown there for you French speakers, um, that uh, the, the benefit of those is, first of all, they're multi-generational and have large numbers of children, um, but, but also much of the Human Genome Project has used these cells 
and therefore the genomics is already in place, and yet, and so you just have to do the phenotyping, and you get the genomics for free. And now there are resources uh, through the NIH and otherwise where large numbers of unrelated individuals with genomic data available and intact um, can, uh, can be uh, brought into the same scenario. And so one of the things that you can do, and I'm showing you a 96 well plate because it's, it's prettier. We do mainly 384 or, or 1536 well plates. Uh, but one can, can do uh, two different drugs on a plate in quadruplicate with increasing drug concentration, several different types of controls on there. And in case of cytotoxicity, do a 72-hour assay with a, a, uh, a, an, an oxidative stress dye um, as, the, as the phenotype. And you can see that some cell lines can have very rapid killing. And these are, are three separate experiments, not three separate plates, but three separate days or, or three separate occasions um, with the, the error bars shown there. So it's, it's pretty tight replication. Uh, admittedly, using uh, robots and barcoding and things that allow you to get better, uh, uh, better data like that. So in this particular cell line, very rapid killing with increasing drug concentration for this cytotoxic drug. And in this cell line, same drug, same concentrations, very little killing to the point where it never even reached 50% killing rate uh, for this drug. And so you see this type of variation. And then one can ask some really fundamental questions. Um, one of the questions is, is the trait heritable? Now, it seems pretty stupid that we didn't do this before. It's embarrassing to think how many millions of dollars I personally spent on genomic analysis without asking the question, is the trait actually inherited? Now, heritability uh, is, is a, a, a phenotype that, that uh, can be influenced by a number of things. It's not just a, a useful predictor of who's uh, whether there's a gene involved. For example, I can't really see because of the lighting, but I imagine that the majority of you have two arms. And there were genes that were involved in, in that, even though the heritability would be quite low. So you can see that heritability is, is a measure of, of variability as well as, as genomic influence. Um, and so one can ask that question using the families, uh, the families of cell lines. And this is data from, a, a, uh, from uh, 14 different families, uh, about 150 uh, different in, uh, participants, looking at uh, uh, the uh, 29 most commonly prescribed um, anti-cancer drugs. And uh, I wish it was 30, because I hate that it's 29. But there was one of the drugs that where we had solubility problems. We couldn't trust the data. Um, so I, I, I hate that it's not 30. But what one can see without even being able to read down here or, is that there are some drugs with very high heritability up in the 60% range, some drugs with very low heritability similar to the, the um, controls, the vehicle controls. And so this, this gradient is present. And one can now say, well, not necessarily that these would not have any genes involved, but certainly you can start prioritizing up on this end of the, of the scenario. Now, at the top of the list here is a drug called temozolomide, which is uh, used for brain tumor uh, treatment. It's an alkylator agent. And so we, we then uh, did a, uh, used a collection of, of uh, 563 unrelated individuals, took their cell lines, looked at temozolomide in, in, uh, in that environment, did a genome-wide association study using in vitro data, and what we found is a, a hit here on chromosome uh, 10. And even without the green lines, you can probably see this, something we, we, um, we, uh, that just came out a, a, a couple months ago uh, with uh, Chad Brown as the first author. And um, you can see here this, uh, this, this hit. Now, the good news is that this, uh, this hit was methylguanine methyltransferase, a gene which repairs DNA adducts. Perfect. The bad news is that biochemists had already shown this gene to be involved 10 years ago or more using traditional biochemical analysis. So the positive spin, of course, is that we validate our approach by finding proof. But the reality is, in this case, uh, we, we found something that somebody had already found before. But we now can take this and look at large numbers of, of, uh, un, of other drugs where we have hits that have not been um, associated previously with these drugs as the start of a series of, of biochemical analyses using shRNA, et cetera, to try to credential which of these genes that we uh, heretofore had not included on our list of, of um, important genes really have some impact um, in, in terms of uh, the effect of these drugs. So this sort of discovery approach is just one of many 
But the idea that we still need to do discovery is so important because you know, often we think, oh, well, you know, the genome era is well, we're well into the, now the second decade. All the discovery has been done. We just need to now apply it. And that is certainly not true. Uh, we do need to apply it. But there's a lot of discovery still to, to, to be made. And matter of fact, there are so few people um, trying to do the discovery um, that it's no, it's no surprise that we're so slow in, in terms of advancing the science. A second aspect is validation. And we really need robust data sets. And, and what, what we've found is that there are very few high quality biobanks out there. There are biobanks in terms of flesh that is stuck in a freezer. But in terms of high quality annotated data, um, there, there's really very little. And, and it's shocking how little is happening within the NIH clinical trials portfolio. There, there are some areas like cancer where now the, the NCI is funding um, either blood or when possible tumor um, accrual. But many of the other institutes have not uh, mandated uh, uh, the collection of blood and other, otherwise. Um, NIMH has done a good job, but there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. And so there's a lot of missed opportunities. Um, one of the things that we did a few years ago in the cancer area is start integrating blood sampling, when possible tumor sampling. And you, you have scenarios where instead of uh, 46 breast cancers from uh, uh, Tampa, Florida, uh, you'll have 4,600 uh, samples from centers all across the United States and Canada where you have captured the variability of multicenter treatment, but in the context of a prospective clinical trial with uh, um, audited re uh, data for both toxicity and efficacy, central review of the imaging, all those kind of quality control measures one needs to trust uh, your phenotype in terms of, of analysis. Um, in, in terms of some of the drugs, uh, there you have some very nice grading with well-defined criteria that have been put forward by the NCI or by the other institutes. So you can really have uniform measurement of toxicity um, in, in there. So here's a study. Uh, the clinical trial was published two years ago. Uh, Dan Hertz has a, a paper on neuropathy that is, is coming out. Um, there's more data uh, to, to be published soon. But this was a study in prostate cancer where docetaxel, a chemotherapy drug, and placebo was compared with docetaxel and bevacizumab, which is an anti-VEGF, anti-vascular um, um, agent. And the, the bottom line clinically was that these two arms were not different in terms of survival. There was a difference in terms of disease progression. But, but not in terms of survival. And so one can go in and do genetic analysis. Here's the most common toxicities. You got neutropenia, you got neuropathy, hypertension, thrombosis, hemorrhage, et cetera. And you can use those phenotypes to try to analyze things, uh, things further. And I'm skipping some of these in the interest of time. And so one can see a, a study design where one could now do uh, validation or even discovery or look at uh, patients who were treated on the trial who experienced neuropathy or who did not experience neuropathy in, in terms of that particular phenotype. Except it's not as simple as that. There are many other things that need to be taken into account. Um, competing events, as they're, they're called. And so uh, it could be that the patient's disease progressed prior to having the chance to get neuropathy, or that they died, or they had some other toxicity, or withdraw, withdrew from the study. There, there are other events. And so the, the, the statistical modeling um, needs to catch up with the clinical reality. We have decent models for a, a, a traditional type of, of strategy. But the competing risk mo analysis models that are out there are OK, but, but not nearly what we need in terms of trying to, uh, to uh, definitively answer these, these questions. Now, the, I'm going to skip over some of this in the interest of time. But the, the bottom line is that um, on this trial, patients got uh, neuropathy, shown in the red line, or this bottom line for those of you that are colorblind. Um, but you had other toxicities, like death and progression, or other adverse events that occurred much more commonly. Um, and so you have to take into account these competing measures. You, you can't just rely um, on a, a yes, no type of phenotype um, in terms of, of that. We also um, often need to take into, do into account dose, because many of the toxicities are dose related in addition to, uh, in, in addition to uh, just the presence of the drug. Um, and so the, the level of sophistication that needs to be uh, put in is the same as disease genomics. You know, diabetes, no diabetes is really not very useful. Diabetes early onset or timing to onset or diabetes well controlled but still having kidney damage. You know, there are other phenotypes that need to be brought into play to really define the patients. 
And the same is true with drug effects. We need to be looking much more sophisticated uh, in terms of, of how we're, we're defining the drug effects, um, not just saying a yes, no, and then wondering why we don't find anything. Now, in, in terms of, of this particular analysis, um, w this is, a, if most of you are familiar with genome-wide association analysis, it's been talked about over the last few weeks of this course. Um, this, this is going along as chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, et cetera. Um, and on this axis is the, the negative uh, log uh, p-value. So the higher the, 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 uh, the value, the more significant. Um, each one of these dots is a region of the genome where there was a single nucleotide polymorphism that gave some level of data. And uh, these are so-called Manhattan plots uh, because when you have a positive finding, you have some sort of gleaming spires like you'd see in, in, in Manhattan, uh, New York. Unfortunately, often it looks more like Manhattan, Kansas. Um, and and uh, in, in this particular case, oops, sorry, um, I had to put red, red uh, circles around the dots or you wouldn't even see them. Um, and yes, they were above a, a certain threshold statistically, but we're, we're often with these phenotypes, they are, they are complex uh, traits. They are not a simple Mendelian style trait. And so one has a number of genes contributing a little um, in terms of its prediction. Now, when you look at the list of genes that are there, you see that some of them are, are when adjusted, are, are uh, genome-wide significant. Others are almost. But every one of the genes has that perfect story uh, for, for why it should be included. And so, you know, it here stabilizes something in Charcot-Marie Tooth, which is a, a peripheral, inherited peripheral neuropathy syndrome. Perfect. Peripheral neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy syndrome, beautiful. Um, this gene here is involved in the dorsal root ganglia and maintaining neuron, oh, perfect. Uh, neural outgrowth, oh, it even says it in the name, great. You know, so what we find is that um, our statisticians uh, will label these gene one, gene two, gene three for us. And by doing that, we have a much more objective discussion about which is important and which is not. Remember Pat Brown talking about the early days of expression arrays where they did a ex gene expression for breast tumor and normal breast ducts, and they got the list of genes and they went, spent the afternoon going through each gene and talking about how, why this one made sense and that one made sense. And then the next morning, the statisticians came in and said, sorry, there was a coding error. Here's the list of genes. Every gene had made perfect sense before, but it just was not true. Um, and unfortunately, the way we've named genes in the genome, um, anything that has cell death in the name or something like that makes a perfect story for any phenotype you care about. Um, and, and so uh, we, 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 uh, yes, we find genes. Yes, they, they seem to have some biologic plausibility, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of replication um, and, and validation and then implementation in terms of how we use it in, in practice. Skip over that in the interest of time. Now, the other thing that one can do is not only uh, take advantage of the clinical trials, but take advantage of the health system. So this is a, an example of something that started at Moffitt by, uh, by Bill Dalton back in 2006. I had nothing to do with it at that time, so to get no credit for it. But um, what Bill did is he developed something called total cancer care, which it's really, the, the most of it is total cancer collection. There is a care aspect to it. Um, but what, what's happened is that you can go in and from, from day one, patients are enrolled in terms of, uh, of clinical follow-up, clinical uh, data uh, warehouse retrieval, um, but also in terms of biobanking. And so, uh, for example, as of a, a, a couple weeks ago, uh, there were um, 105,000 tumors that had been banked um, at Moffitt, um, all with a, a extensive clinical information available longitudinally, consented from day one to allow a whole genome analysis if you want to do that um, in terms of the way forward. And there have been some of these, for example, 16,000 of these have had gene expression analysis done, 4,000 have had targeted exome, you know, there's been a small number that have had whole, whole uh, genome, et cetera. Um, so, so one can, if one builds a biobank longitudinally and lets it grow with, investment, with purposeful investment, one can start reaping rewards. Now, most biobanks were designed for deposit and not withdrawal. If you put your money into a bank that was for deposit and not withdraw, you, you'd be pissed. You know, you want an ATM on every corner. You don't just want to be able to go in and get your money out. You want to be, have it convenient. As a matter of fact, you want an app where you can just do the transfer on the app. You don't even want to have to ever go to the bank ever again. Um, and and biobanks 
traditionally have not been designed with people in mind. They've been designed with sticking uh, uh, pieces of flesh in a freezer. Um, and and we, we need to be rethinking how we're doing biobanking. Because biobanks are great if you want to know tumor versus normal or one tissue versus another tissue. But if you want to discover what's associated with some sort of outcome, toxicity, efficacy, whatever, you need to have high quality phenotype. Phenotype rules the day. You can sequence whatever you want, but if you have crappy phenotypes, you'll learn nothing. Um, and so uh, we really need a lot more attention placed on that in, in order to improve the, the, uh, the infrastructure that we have in this country for, for doing this sort of work. Skip that in the interest of, of time. Now, it, the, the last part I want to uh, spend a little time on is, is application. And some of this will be spent on traditional application. What are we doing for the patient that is in clinic today? And then some of it will be application in terms of public health use of pharmacogenomic data, uh, which is a little bit different than maybe you were expecting, uh, but also an opportunity in terms of trying to help uh, developing countries in particular make decisions about uh, which medicines are, are available in their, in their countries. Now, I showed this list before, lots of different types of drugs uh, that, that are available. Um, and what, what's uh, interesting is that many of these drugs have very little um, application um, data that's out there. There are very few implementation science studies that have been done with any of these examples. There's been some quality of data that has got into a prestigious journal that has led the FDA to make the change, uh, but traditionally, not a lot of how do we actually implement it in, in routine practice. Now, one example that's a, a bit controversial, and I'll, I'll tell you about that, um, but, but has really taught us a lot is one that I'm going to show you here. We've published some on this, and then there's some of this data is not yet published. Um, but the, the concepts were important enough that I thought I would take that risk. Now, tamoxifen is a drug used for breast cancer. It's an old drug. Um, the, the drug itself is not so potent in terms of an anti-estrogen. Matter of fact, it's not very potent at all. Um, but uh, it needs to be activated to metabolites, which are potent anti-estrogens. And uh, when I trained, 4-hydroxytamoxifen uh, was the main drug, the, the active metabolite. And there was a, a bunch of different enzymes that were involved in activating it. And so there was not really a lot of variability. Um, and therefore, um, that was the end of the story. But uh, a, a few years ago, almost a decade ago, ago now, uh, Barrett Stearns and David Flockhart, when they were at Georgetown, um, saw a, a woman who um, was, had breast cancer, was receiving tamoxifen, was getting the hot flashes that one gets with the perimenopausal syndrome. As you block estrogen, you, you get this type of syndrome. Many of the patients have it. Um, she also had clinical depression, was seen by, a, I, I, I'm not sure if it was a psychiatrist or a, a, a family medicine person, but anyway, was given an antidepressant, and her hot flashes went away. And they went away very quickly. So if it was me, I would be quite excited. Hot flashes went away. Somewhere around the next four or six weeks, the depression will probably benefit. Anybody with Scottish blood loves two for the price of one. So fantastic, right? Well, Vered's a, a KG Israeli. She didn't uh, think that was right, that something that took four to six weeks to work for depression would autom you know, right away affect uh, hot flashes. Something was going on. And through a, a number of years of very difficult analysis, they identified that there was a metabolite that, that they called endoxifen. It was a known metabolite, but not a prioritized metabolite. Um, was was um, a very uh, potent antiestrogen. It was also something that was formed mainly through this two-step process down here. And the reason it was relevant is that the antidepressant that was given blocked CYP2D6. So the reason the hot flashes went away is that active drug was not being formed anymore. Now, the good news is that you blocked formation of active metabolites. You don't have hot flashes. The bad news is you have no anti-cancer protection. And so what we saw uh, dramatically is as this was presented at, in, in June of, of a, a few years back at the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting, almost immediately, looking back at prescribing data, almost immediately, people stopped using that, those types of antidepressants in patients receiving tamoxifen. It was just a, a wholesale, they just stopped doing it. Patients that were already on them were switched to other antidepressants. They still used antidepressants to try to fight hot flashes, uh, but, but not the ones that, that block this step of, of activation. And so it was very widely accepted to this day, still is, uh, that you do not want to mess with CYP2D6 uh, 
in terms of tamoxifen therapy. Now, the funny thing, it's kind of a, a um, genetic exceptionalism type of story. So with a drug interaction, it was blindly accepted that you don't want to mess here, and therefore we will not use those drugs. But yet 10% of you in the room, and 10% of you watching, um, are, um, are missing this gene, either missing a, uh, both copies of the gene from deletion or um, having a very low or no function uh, based on, on point mutation. And, and so th those folks you'd think will be as, at, as or more risk of a bad effect um, than the people with drug interactions, because drug interactions might occur, and it's very much blood level dependent, et cetera, whereas genetics, it, it does occur. It's, there's not a, a, a lot of, a, of a, a variation there. Um, and so there have been a number of studies that have shown a story similar to this one, where the people with two copies, the extensive metabolizers, have the better outcome compared to people with one normal co one working copy or no working copies of this particular gene. So the poor metabolizers, as they're called, um, uh, have, a, have a worse outcome. Now, while this is an independent effect compared to other factors, you'll see that even the good ri risk group, every time there's a little blip here, someone's breast cancer has recurred. And so it still does happen. It's not like this is the gene that, that cures breast cancer, but it does seem to have some effect. And there have been a number of studies showing that this, uh, this type of scenario. There have also been some studies that have, been, that have shown that this does not occur. Now, in, in some of the cases, a very high dose of tamoxifen was given or a lot of extra chemotherapy was given. In, in some cases, the, the tissue of, of uh, in one case, it was a prevention study, um, that, that, uh, so a, a different scenario in terms of incidence. Um, in, in the last two cases, um, tumor DNA was used, and so there's some confusion there about the relevance because ab about 30% of breast cancers um, have a deletion in the region of this gene, and therefore, when you genotype with breast cancer tissue, what are you really genotyping? And there's still a lot of controversy about whether these studies uh, told us that this gene is irrelevant or whether this, uh, the, the, the studies uh, showed us that we need to use the right tissue. So still to be defined with that. But this, this idea that we have a group that does well, a group that does poorly, uh, they can stay on the one pill a day, 20 milligram tamoxifen, and they need to have something else. Easy except 40% of, of women are in this group here, this middle line. And so as, as oncologists started to do testing, many of us started to get phone calls saying, hey, uh, what do I do with these folks? And the reality is we didn't know. We didn't know what to do. Um, and so some studies that were done, and, and one of the papers came out a, a couple years ago. There's another paper that is, is uh, under review uh, right now on, on this. Um, the first 119 patients have been published, and as I mentioned, as I showed down here, an additional 500 patients is now uh, being, uh, uh, being reviewed. What we did in this study was really simple. We took patients that had been on tamoxifen for at least four months. So based on the pharmacokinetics, they reached steady state. We then uh, measured active metabolite levels shown on this axis. We also did CLIA-level genotyping, clinical-grade genotyping for CYP2D6. And what we found is what others had found. There was a statistical difference between the intermediate metabolizers and the, poor me and the extensive metabolizers. People that have two normal copies or only one working copy of the gene has statistically different active metabolite levels. No surprise, but it was nice still to, to see that. What we did is these folks here, they stayed on one pill a day. And four months later, there was a slight decrease, not statistically different, probably due to adherence in terms of taking the meds. Um, but not, not a lot of change that occurred there. These folks here with the low levels, we did something really simple. We had them take two pills instead of one. Nothing earth shattering, nothing crazy, you know, um, just that. And the FDA approved dosing is between 10 and 40 milligrams. So they went from 20 milligrams a day to 40 milligrams a day. We didn't even have to file an IND because it was with the, within the approved dosing. And what we found is that there was no longer a statistical difference between blood levels at that point. We had normalized blood level. Now, uh, two additional studies, one from Tokyo and one from uh, New York City, um, have now replicated this, this finding. So it's something that, that definitely does occur. There's a significant difference here, and we can normalize it based on genotype-derived dosing. One pill versus two, really simple stuff. What, what, uh, what's, what's funny about it is that this sort of data is exactly what's behind 
most of the FDA dosing recommendations. So if you dose based on kidney function, it's a pharmacokinetic study uh, that, uh, that derived that dosing. PK, pharmacokinetics were 50% different, therefore you give a 50% different dose. Drug interactions are all, almost all peak pharmacokinetic based interactions. And the, the goal is to normalize by taking into account drug interaction, organ dysfunction, age, whatever the factor might be. And so from that standpoint, uh, we've now defined and others have replicated um, a way of normalizing blood levels. What's controversial is whether this, this sort of normalization will impact survival at all. And so we went and enrolled um, a total of 500 women from across North Carolina. I was up in University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill at that time. We enrolled uh, 500 women. The, the outcome now data is now maturing. We need five-year uh, survival data, so it's going to take um, a few years to do that. Um, but we have been able to show that in the 500 patients, we indeed can replicate this, this finding, where there's a significant difference at the start that one can uh, normalize based on this interaction. The other thing is that we were able to do this study in 64 of the 100 North Carolina counties. We, we took this study out of the academic center, out into the community, and we were able to enroll a genotype guided therapy study out there just fine. Matter of fact, we thought we would, we would enroll 100 patients in five years. We enrolled 119 in four months, expanded it to 500, and enrolled 500 in 14 months. And the reason why is it was a very simple study. It was a simple concept that any oncologist could understand and any patient can understand. And we had the weird scenario where we didn't have to advertise. The patients did it. The very first patient that came in, I, I met with her, along with Billy Irvin and some of the others that were involved, um, told her about the study, and she's like, yeah, I want to be involved with that, sure. Fine. She left the room. We, we then called in the next patient, and we were in quiet phase, just making sure our, we had IRB approval, but making sure the forms were correct, whatever. The patient came in and said, I want to be on the DNA study. We're like, how did you find out about it? Like, oh, a woman came out and went around and told everybody in the waiting room. Um, patients think we already do personalized medicine. They think we already do this stuff. They want to have their care to be shaped after their body, the way that they, they, uh, their liver acts or whatever it might be. Um, and so uh, patients are on board with this sort of stuff, but we need to do the trials to show that it really is the right thing to do. And we'll, we'll find out in terms of that. Another um, area that, we've, that is important is with opportunistic infections. So whether it's HIV or, or, or um, uh, cancer or whatever it might be, often it's not the, the disease that kills the patient, it's the opportunistic infection. And certainly in the case of, of uh, uh, myeloid malignancies, acute myeloid leukemia in particular, um, you have a, a, a very high risk of fungal infection, and many patients will die of, of fungal infection. And so there have been studies that have shown that, um, sorry for the complex drawing here, um, that, uh, that vericonazole, an antifungal drug, um, needs to be, uh, it works by itself, but it can be inactivated by a number of genes, including uh, uh, CYP2C19 uh, that, that uh, show you here. And uh, we already know that people who have two bad copies of the gene um, have very low blood levels. And then there's some people that have extra copies of the gene that have very high levels. Um, and so those people um, have high levels and often get hallucination and other effects. Um, the, there's others that, that can chew the drug up really fast um, and, uh, and get, they do not reach therapeutic range in terms of, of their blood levels. And indeed, this is an ugly slide that I need to, um, and apologies to the authors, but this is an ugly slide. Um, the, the, what we found is that it, normally the, the rate of ultra-rapid metabolizers is, is somewhere around 20% uh, or so. And yet 80% of the patients with, uh, with, with, uh, unachieve, with, that did not achieve therapeutic blood levels had this particular genotype. So there's an enrichment. The people who chew up the drug too fast can't get therapeutic levels and are the ones that have uh, a, a, a fungal infection. Now, the reason for belaboring this story is, is um, we, we wanted to go and, and start implementing this in, in our cancer patients, in our leukemia patients in particular. But we felt, you know, we need to do an economic analysis to see whether this is, is really relevant. What we hadn't realized is using our own institutional data, a, a person who gets a fungal infection co costs an extra $30,000, well, $29,500, um, and, and compared to someone who does not get a fungal infection. 
And so we did a number of different economic analysis. And Neil Mason from our group did this. We could not find a scenario where it wasn't cost effective to genotype everybody because if you, re if you uh, prevent one case, you've paid for everyone in spades. Um, and so often we have to include these economic analyses in addition to the science to make sure that we can make the case for that. You know, if I could uh, 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 keep uh, a few leukemic patients from getting a fungal infection, but bankrupt my entire institution, I'm not doing anyone any favors. Um, and so we, we have to bring in not only the science of implementation and the science of, of, uh, of, of, of discovery and validation, but also get the economists and others involved in terms of, of the, the application. Now, I also want to mention a little bit about the complexities that are becoming normal um, in, in terms of, of cancer care. You know, it, it wasn't that long ago that we would say, oh, there's a tumor in the bowel, therefore this is bowel cancer. Or maybe we get fancy and call it colorectal cancer. That's, that's great. Well, then you can look at it under a, a microscope and stain it and say, oh, it's an adenocarcinoma. There's some ducts there, so there's a gland there. So there's an adenocarcinoma of the colon. Very fancy, very fancy. Oh, well, now we can genotype it, in this case for KRAS gene, and say, oh, it's a KRAS mutant. It's a codon 12 KRAS mutant adenocarcinoma of the colon. Wow, we're starting to get pretty fancy here. That's very, well, now we start getting into some of these realities. And this is a, uh, a uh, I'd use my iPhone to do a, take a picture of this report, um, a, a sequencing of uh, one of our patient's tumors. And you, maybe you can see up here that there is an abnormality in P53, in EP300, and DDX3X uh, gene is, is lost. Well, that's great. And now we have to go and dig, figure out, well, what are those genes? And, and should it matter? And, and the report from the company says that this really has no relevance in terms of FDA-approved therapy, and there are no clinical trials involved. So are we really any smarter? With, and there's a, a list of a bunch of other genes that are abnormal that no one has a clue what to do with because this, these variations are just, and the handwriting's on here because we get together and try to figure out what in the heck do we do with this stuff. Um, so it's no longer the case where uh, it's a simple little colon cancer or a simple little leukemia. Um, we're getting a, a, big, a high layer of complexity such that the informaticists and the biochemists are heavily involved in trying to help us understand what to do with the clinical data. Folks that were used to be in another building and we never met except in the cafeteria um, are now an integral part in terms of how we manage our patients because we need their expertise in terms of, of trying to interpret. It's really, we're at the point, or the, you know, the early stage of consensus opinion, not at the stage where we have definitive data saying, yes, if you have a, 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 a HIST1H1E mutation at codon 47, um, we know exactly what to do. We don't have a clue what to do and we need to dig into it and find out, are there trials? Is it likely to be important? What do we actually do with all this stuff? Another, switching gears from the, the tumor side, another part is, what do we do with the rest of the world? We, that's great that we can do genotype guided whatever for, for cancer or for HIV or for whatever your favorite disease is, but, but what do we do in most of the world? Most people don't have access to the genome. Most people don't have access to um, any of the stuff we've been, been talking about in this whole series. So what does it mean? Uh, and modern therapy has been a, a key component of improving health and really a, is a sizable part of most um, health budgets. In, in, the, in the developing world, most of the time, the, the buildings are not super expensive. The, the people are, are not super expensive. The, the cost of equipment is, is minimal. Don't have a lot of the super expensive equipment. But the, the medicines, even the cheap generic medicines from, from uh, India or other parts, um, are, are still expensive in terms of the, the proportion of the healthcare budget. And when you look at selecting medicines, um, often it's a combination of clinical consensus, access to, to and, and cost, and familiarity. And so you, you have these sorts of, of scenarios, and medicine prioritization is really a high stakes undertaking um, in most of the, of the developing world. When, when you look at the WHO essential medicines list, which is the, the national formulary um, for that most uh, countries use outside of the, the, the richer countries, what you see on there is that there might be five medicines for your favorite disease. And if you can only afford one or two, how do you pick? The data um, uh, up until even 2014 
is, is heavily skewed towards Western Europe, United States, and Australia. We, we have data that's coming from certain populations of the world, but they don't necessarily benefit or, or give direct data for, for the rest of the world. And so instead of having data for the individual patient, we have data from certain parts of the world that are inferred uh, across uh, the rest of the world. And so if, if you're in, in this case, uh, 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 Nicaragua uh, or in, in other, other parts, and you're trying to make a decision about what, is your, what medicines do you pay for, uh, you can't pay for them all. You can't afford that. So how do you select? And Nicaragua is not a participant in the phase three clinical trial networks that are currently out there. There have been no trials, no patients enrolled for Nicaragua in any of the FDA approved trials over the last 15 years. You have nothing to go on in terms of trying to make your decision at the, the Ministry of Health level. And, and so what we've been doing is, it, others have been doing is trying to look at, can we use pharmacogenetic data to augment a decision uh, that, a, that a country's Ministry of Health or Health Authority might be making to provide some local context for, uh, for that. And, and the way we've been doing that, and we've worked in uh, 104 countries so far, um, is to identify uh, the most common groups within the country. They might be ethnic, they might be racial, they might be religious, whatever the, the country decides are those groups. En enroll um, uh, volunteers from these different groups um, and, and look at uh, genes, uh, gene variants that have been shown to influence toxicity or efficacy for um, medicines that are on the WHO essential medicines list. Not alterations in pharmacokinetics, but alterations in actual um, dosing, toxicity, or efficacy. And those alterations have had to be found in at least two separate populations in order to be included on the, the list. This is something from the Pharmacogenetics for Every Nation initiative, or p -Genie, as it as it's called. Think P. Diddy, uh, except p -Genie. Um, and so one can go in, and if you take an example with mercaptopurine, which is used for um, arthritis, for inflammatory bowel disease, it's also used for childhood leukemia, but that's a, uh, the smallest uh, therapeutic category. It uh, happens to be the only FDA-approved category, but it's the smallest therapeutic category in terms of its use. There are, are three different genetic variants in the thiopurine methyltransferase gene that inactivate, uh, that influence the inactivation. And so if you have one of these different alleles, um, you can't break the drug down very well. You get extreme toxicity um, and, and, uh, and, and need to either be hospitalized or at the least come off the, the medicine. And it's been well shown by multiple groups now that there is very different dosing depending on whether you have two normal copies of the gene or two abnormal copies of the gene. Uh, it's almost one-tenth of the normal dose that, that one would take in that, in that scenario. So that's great. So this is some, some of the initial data. Um, from, from a, a while back now, and, and if you see green, that means the data is similar to what's seen in the U.S. white population. And the reason why the U.S. whites were the comparison is not because I'm from the U.S. and white, uh, but rather um, because the dosing and safety data was almost exclusively done um, in the, the initial stages in U.S. populations. Phase two and phase three then go out um, to, to other parts of the world. And, and so you can see there's many countries that, that have green. Some countries have light blue. That means the genetic risk is one half or less of that seen in, in, um, uh, in, the, in the US white population. And then there are some countries, Bulgaria, Ghana, and, and uh, Peru in this particular slide that have more than double the genetic risk uh, for this incident. And so um, the connection between those three countries is a bit perilous. Uh, uh, you know, there's cocoa in two of the three, and, and uh, a, a few, who knows what else. Um, but those are three countries that, that really stood out. Now, and here is, is in a continuous variable, if one looks within Ghana, um, in, in West Africa, um, looking at, at some of the more uh, common uh, subpopulations within the country, uh, what you find is that all of them have about a, a 10 percent incidence of this severe risk, a very high incidence. Um, and, and often what people say is, well, geographically, um, why don't you just look somewhere in Africa, and then you'll get African data, and somewhere in South America, you'll get South American data. And I, well, here's uh, the data from one of the Nigerian populations. The frequency of genetic risk for this particular example in this population is half of that seen in their neighbors, or two small countries in between them, um, uh, in, in Ghana. Matter of fact, the Nigerians in this case, the risk was more similar to the UK Caucasians and the US Caucasians than it was their neighbors in West Africa. 
And so one can't just take a, 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 a blind look, to just get the region and try to get it right. Here's another example. This is CYP2C19. Um, it inactivates voriconazole, an antifungal drug, as I showed you a couple of slides ago. It's also involved in, in the uh, activation of, of Plavix or Clopidogrel for uh, cardiac disease. And what you can kind of see up here, this is CYP2C19 STAR2 variant. Um, here's one Ghanaian population with a very high frequency of this, uh, this variation of this mutation. And here's another Ghanaian, Ghanaian population, uh, the, the, the Fonte versus the Ewe, um, very different frequencies, even within the same country. Um, and so, and then you can see some, some of the Kenyan populations and Nigerian populations next to them. So the, the point being that by looking within an individual country, working with the Ministry of Health, trying to define what is the level of risk within the populations that they define, one can start getting some data. It's, it's not so much a clear decision based on this, but it's, it's tiebreaker type data. We're using it almost like a currency converter. You know, how many pesos equals a dollar? How, you know, how which drugs are more likely to be uh, safe uh, in Ghana versus another? And using this more, more broadly. And one can use the data in terms of, of prioritization of, uh, or surveillance. So in, in the case of, of a high incidence of, of liver toxicity from isoniazid, one is still going to give isoniazid. There's not a good alternative yet, um, but you'll monitor more carefully. Um, and, and that is this data we've, we've uh, this is some of the data for liver uh, toxicity risk from isoniazid with countries like China um, using this data to help define uh, the way they monitor these patients. In other cases, we can have clinical algorithms for the available drugs, in this case for rheumatoid arthritis, where based on the genetic data within the country, one can start breaking this down into a clear decision. This is for a small uh, uh, Eastern Asian country called China, um, where one can take the drugs that are available and help prioritize them in terms of, of, uh, of level of risk. So for example, methotrexate, they have a very high incidence of a resistance gene with thymidylase synthase. Um, and you know, it, it was already known that methotrexate didn't work as well. Now they figured out why. Um, and so one can use this in terms of coming up with priorities uh, for, uh, for, for their medicine. We can also look more broadly. This is data from uh, Affymetrix's uh, DMET Plus chip, um, looking at 7,000 individuals across 40 different countries. And you can see that here's the average predicted warfarin dose on this axis. And you can see that in some cases, the average dose is extremely small. Other cases, it's very high based on the different geographic um, continental uh, separations. GI risk from uh, amodiaquin, a malaria drug, again, high risk, low risk, uh, a lot of variation within a continent. Uh, risk of semistatin, muscle toxicity, the same type of thing. One can start putting together these sorts of maps um, and reports for the Ministry of Health to now not just take the WHO essential medicine list and say, huh, we gotta pick one of these, uh, but use this data to try to say, you know what, we can now prioritize based on this and we can only afford the following three, so we'll, we'll use, use it in that, in that sort, of, uh, sort of manner. The, uh, in, in closing here, the, the, I think the key thing is that we've become decent at discovery and, and, and validation. We, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of, of health economic integration of health systems. Um, you can tell this slide is old because there's a Blackberry on there. And for you, for you young people, Blackberries used to be like an iPhone. Um, you probably haven't heard of them, but they're. Um, and um, assay development, a lot of work still, still to be done. Um, and, uh, I'm going to finish up with this, this particular story from a, a friend of mine in North Carolina. At the time, he was 44 years old. He's the chief scientific officer of a, uh, a biotech company in, in uh, North Carolina. He was born with what he calls a frog heart. Uh, he has an AV block due to this congenital heart defect. He needed to have a pacemaker placed, but because of his anatomy, he had to have his chest crack to, to place it. Um, and, and so he told the cardiologist, the CT surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the mitting team, um, these, these folks here, that he had, he'd had an executive physical, that he had pharmacogenetic analysis, and that he couldn't activate oxycodone very well or, or, or codeine, and also had to have some different dosing of, of warfarin. So that's fine. They, they noted that and went on with their way. Successful surgery, successful placement, rather, of the, of the pacemaker. Um, in the uh, recovery room, morphine uh, was giving him some decent pain control, four out of ten uh, in, the, in the scale. He'd had his chest cracked, so it's, you know, it's sort of a painful thing. Um, he moved to the coronary care unit. He was switched to oral medicines to oxycodone and had very severe pain, was basically ignored. Um, he was a wimp, you know, he's in pain, just needs to buck up. Um, 
he uh, called me from the CCU, uh, said, you know, you have to come and rescue me. Uh, I called one of the cardiologists at that, um, at that university who had, uh, I had, had trained with me at, when I was at Wash U and said, hey, come on, you got to go save this guy. Uh, before he got in there, uh, one of the medical students and one of the pharmacists were pre-rounding, saw this, this man in severe pain, um, talked to him, found out he was a poor metabolizer for CYP2B6. So his ability to activate oxycodone and other pain meds is not as good as most people. Switched him to a different med, in this case hydromorphone, which gave him a much better degree of pain control. Still 5 out of 10, but he, he had his chest crack, you know. Um, now this happened at one of the top five cardiac centers in the United States. A very high profile institution that happens to be eight miles away from University of North Carolina. Rhymes with Duke. Um, a phenomenal place. I literally have gone there for cardiac uh, evaluation because it's such a great place. The anesthesiologist who was involved literally wrote the book on post anesthesia pain. And yet world famous cardiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons, anesthesiologists, incredibly smart fellows, residents and interns didn't recognize the data when it was in front of them. Now if this had happened at UNC it would have been just as bad or worse. And we did a lot of cross training based on this case where Jeff Ginsburg came over and, and trained uh, us at UNC and I went over and helped train them at, at Duke. But the, the bottom line was even with the data in our face, we don't always recognize when it's ready for use. And so we can't have a scenario where we just publish smart papers. We, we have to be thinking about implementation. And the best scenario is one where no one has to know about it because it's baked into the electronic health record. Um, and this sort of data is a hard stop to switch over to a different medicine and no one has to remember anything because the computers do that. And that's something that is now in place at many centers, as is now in place at Duke, um, and, and it's something that, that is applied. So I'll finish with this slide. You know, back at the last Olympics, the one in London, Usain Bolt did not win the 4 by 100 relay. Jamaica won the 4 by 100 relay, men's relay. Usain Bolt ran a phenomenal leg, just a terrific leg, but so did three other guys. And if they hadn't ran terrific legs, Jamaica would not have won. It, it's the same type of thing. You know, when you go to a, b past a track where they're practicing, they spend hours on the handoff. You know, how do you receive, you know, someone's coming, you start running, you receive the baton, or you hand the baton off a certain way, you take up. Because if you drop the baton, you're out of the race, your team's out of the race, your school's out of the race, your country's out of the race, it's a big deal. We have the same scenario in biomedical sciences. We need to go from discovery to validation, integration to practice, integration to policy. We can't, one person can't do all this. It needs to be people who are really good at this and really good at this, really good at that. But our handoff is lousy. Often my dissemination strategy is osmosis. You know, I publish something and hope that someone accidentally reads it. As opposed to saying, all right, who's gonna use this data how do I interact with them so I make sure that the data we're putting out can be most useful to them as they run forward? You know, walk through any foyer or any um, atrium in any uh, research, uh, biomedical research institution in the United States, and there are batons all over the floor. You're going to trip on a baton uh, because we've dropped so many of them over time. But we have to get better at that. And I think that's the big challenge now. If we want to make progress, yeah, we need to be smart. Yeah, we need to have the latest technology but we need to be thinking about how do we do this relay race and how do we do it better. And it means we have to talk to people we may not even like um, and make sure that they're on board and that they're ready to receive what we're doing um, because otherwise we might get promoted, we might get a free trip to Bethesda, but are we really gonna help a single person? Um, and so that's the challenge, not just for pharmacogenomics, but especially in this area, you know, how do we do it better? And I'll stop at that point, thank you very much. <laughs> any Dr. any McLeod? general questions and I'll and then all anybody who wants can join the conversation to vote for Hi. Uh, may Hi, I ask how are a you? question? Hi. Uh, sure. excellent talk. Fast fascinating subject. Um I, I had a question about the complexity of the challenge of pharmacogenomics. Um, I had a, uh, the pleasure of spending a little time with the PGRN uh, about a year and a half ago, yeah, this uh, NIH-supported yep. uh, pharmacogenomics uh, research yeah. network. Yeah. And um, 
the, the issues that seem to confront it now, particularly in the area of cancer therapeutics, have gone up uh, almost exponentially in complexity with the recognition that cancer tumors, particularly the solid tumors, are not homogeneous genetically. And so I wanted to know what your thoughts are about how this is going to impact pharmacogenomics. Well, very much so. In terms of the cancer side, I mean, now what we're doing, so it, before with next-gen sequencing of tumors clinically, you thought, oh, maybe we need to do 30x coverage, 30 times coverage for that. We're, we're now doing uh, routinely about 1,000x coverage. And the reason why is that we know there are subpopulations that are there, and you can't see them if you just do 100x. Or, or You need to do very deep resequencing clinically in a CLIA environment in order to find those and act on them accordingly. We're also using um, serum more often now, or plasma, um, to look at our mutation clones, that, mutants that are arising over time, kind of in, in a uh, minimal residual disease type model that you'd use in leukemia. Um, because we, we can, with the technology that's out there, one can now find things way before there's an imaging change or there's a symptomatic change and, and decide whether to act on it. And so it's, it has changed our complexity quite dramatically. But there are, are some institutions, uh, uh, like our own, that have really embraced this and are trying to use the heterogeneity that is definitely present to, as an advantage in terms of choosing therapy. Um, it, it is, there's no doubt that life, so life never was simple. It's just that we like to think it was. Um, and in some ways, we're just kind of hitting reality a little bit harder than we want. But you are exactly right that whether it's uh, uh, you know, an autoimmune disease or a, a complex cancer, Life is not as simple as it used to be. Another quick question, sure. if I may. Um, do you see the benefits now of stem cell technology in terms of setting up high-throughput screenings for uh, both um, cellular and, and neuropathic uh, toxicities uh, as a pre-event before going to, say, humanized animal models? And, you know. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still a little bit skeptical about uh, that, that approach for the, the treatment of cancer in, in cases where there's so much heterogeneity. Because you, you have to do so many things. You have to introduce so I, many no, I was referring to marker and- Oh, marker, right. oh yeah, okay. Because we are looking at stem cell therapies for toxicity. You know, if you can introduce stem cell therapies to someone who has a genetic predisposition, I skipped some of those slides, um, for, for neuropathy, uh, one can try to bypass that event. That's still very much a research tool uh, but, but one that is evolving. In, in terms of, of markers of stemness, or whatever you want to call it, um, at the moment, they, they are definitely measurable, uh, or at least there are, are measurements that are called uh, stemness, but we, we haven't figured out, at least, we haven't figured out yet how to apply them in a regular basis clinically. So they're very much a research tool. There are people now that are, you know, flow sorting out at, at many institutions, including our own, you know, flow sorting out these different subtypes of cells reintroducing them into mice and other systems, trying to understand does one, uh, you know, is that really a subpopulation that needs differential treatment? You know, how does one treat it? Um, it could be that uh, you know, once we're smarter, we will treat that small subpopulation and uh, ignore the rest. Uh, but at least that's the way, I'm not sure I answered you, the question the way you meant it, but um, you can kind of see the direction things have been heading. 